Father, we thank you, we bless you, we continue to worship you. And we know, Father, how important it is to let you do a great and mighty work in us. We ask, so, Father, that you open the eyes of our understanding, pour out the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Grant that the eyes of our understanding be open and enlightened, that we may know the hope of your calling, all the riches of the inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power. The same power that is upon our lives with the life of God that will bring us to the fullness of you, Father. Thank you for all your grace and mercy. We give you all praise and worship in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now, let's look from where uh, we have um, begun. And just to wrap up where we are, and let me grab uh, this little pointer. Yes, so we are wrapping up and we say how uh, point A, point B, point C the last week, that... Uh, Predestination is uh, before the foundation of the world. All these are given unto us. Be free choice and, uh, and that is it. But what we have touched on last week is based on free choice. God knows everything we will choose. We are still free, but God knows. So by foreknowledge, He knows how we will respond and how we will choose. So all our choices that we choose, that even we ourselves do not know. Right? Like, Mohan, do you know what you'll be eating uh, on November the 21st for lunch? He doesn't know. Right? Unless we plan, we wouldn't know. But God knows. And it's going to be your free choice. Right? God is not going to say, you must eat this at that time. Still free choice. But God knows our free choice. And He knows every decision that we make and even the color of shirt that you'll be wearing. Because for some of you, guessing me is easy. Black or black. <laughs> right. So, but uh, assuming you got a lot of clo different clothes, then it's harder to guess. And uh, when your clothes are standard, you know, after wearing different uh, clothes, you know, you just get bored with clothes, you know. And just, uh, you just want to wear how many clothes. But on this earth, you just stay to the same. Uh, and uh, so, God knows what color clothes you're going to wear uh, three years from now. And exactly what you're going to wear. Even, you might not even have bought it yet. You haven't made a decision to buy it yet. But God already knows what you're going to buy, what you're going to buy, and what you're going to wear. His foreknowledge, being God, is complete. Everything of our future is passed to God. And then see, based on what He, he knows our choices are, He intervenes on those choices. He, he see, He says, okay, these people are choosing me anyway. So let me add this into their life. And these people have chosen not to be with me. So he acts upon that based on his foreknowledge. And let's move to the next scale. And uh, that's today's. Today, we talk about the tension between predestination and free will that we have to cover. And I illustrated how that this circle represents predestination. And free will is actually inside predestination. No matter how far you run, you cannot escape that God's plan for this whole universe, for the planet, for every detail that He wants to go through will still take place. The human actors and actresses might be different, but the plan will go on. Nothing can stop God's plan. And knowing how small we are in the scheme of things, we better keep choosing God to ensure that we are part of the good plan, not part of the bad plan. And remember, like Shakespeare said, the world is a stage of which we all are actors now. Now, uh, and you want a scripture for that? Not, I'm not quoting for Shakespeare. Hebrews chapter 12. There is a cloud of witnesses watching us. Because for those who have lived and died and gone to heaven, there's nothing more they can do. But for us, we still can make choices. We still can turn 180 degrees around. We still can be humble and say, look, I made a mistake there. Let's change and move this direction. It is still possible. And that's where all the preaching and persuasion and all that is to persuade us to choose God and not make the wrong mistakes. Because the Bible is the Bible written, correct? 
Esau cannot come back and say, I'd like to choose this one. Neither the brothers of Jesus, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the brothers of uh, uh, some of them uh, who choose different directions, or let's say some of the apostles. Judas cannot come back and say, I'd like to rechoose. Once it's written, it's written. So he passed a certain point, become from wet semen, become dry semen. Once dry semen, there's nothing that can be changed. And even in the process now, when we make a wrong decision, it's still wet semen. It's wet semen until somebody else takes that role. Then you cannot go back to it. For example, when God told uh, Solomon uh, and told Jer Jeroboam, Solomon that this is the judgment is coming for, is going to cut him down. And uh, by his son's time, Rehoboam, he got, brought judgment and gave ten tribes to Jeroboam. The moment God predict it, in fact, when God speak about it, remember, when God speak, it's as good as done. On the day that the prophet prophesied to Jeroboam, take ten pieces of clothing, nothing can be done. No repentance can change what God already changed. That's why it's important to have the dimension of free choice, that nothing can abort God's general plan. So free will is not presented like that, where anything can go outside of the control of God. No such thing. Free will will only exist inside God. So we talk about tension, and we talk about how the goal of predestination is to be conformed to Christ. Which means that it's important for us to aim for the attributes of God. God's predestination is not just for us to be successful. Success is only viewed from this earth. Okay, from heaven. Isn't everything in heaven successful? Nothing is unsuccessful. It is viewed from a fallen point of view, we see failure and success. There's no such thing, no such concept. Everything is successful when it flows into the plan of God. So let's get rid of this worldly thinking and realize that looking at success and failure is looking at it from our child's point of view. We must make sure and look at it saying that, okay, the main aim of God is to have us conform to God. Not what we do, but what we are. There's nothing here about doing in the predestination, Romans 8. We are chosen to be conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, it's being the attributes of God. And here, our free will, as we choose the perfect will of God, we get rewards. Uh, rewards in the judgment seat, gifts of God, positions based on what we have chosen here. Now, I'm going to show these dynamics, but I've shown here. Now, from here, we progress to another level of discussion. Okay, is it this one? Uh, no, next one. Ah, this one here. I show the tension between uh, predestination and free will is like the earth or the sun here and the moon or the earth here rotating uh, around. It's not, of course, we know it's not a complete circle. It's more like a parabolic shape. Uh, and um, so at one point it slows down and then it speeds up, slows down and speeds up. But for ease of visualization, I put it as a circle. And we have, let's say, the moon and the earth. The gravitational pull of the earth is pulling, uh, pulling the moon towards the earth. But the moon has its own velocity. It's traveling at a certain speed, and it wants to escape. When the two forces are playing on each other, you have this uh, perpendicular force, which brings it round and round, for it to orbit around around uh, the earth. So the force that keeps pulling the moon towards the earth to line up and to be close to the earth is the force of predestination. The force that pulls us away is our free choice, our movement. We can be free. And those two forces continue working together, two forces working in order to produce the uh, orbit of the moon around the earth or of the earth around the sun takes two forces. One force cannot be. If only gravity is working, the moon will fall to the earth. If only uh, velocity of free will working, the moon will fly off and never come back again and go somewhere like a meteorite or asteroid uh, that flows around. Then I ask a question. We all know that 
nature and nurture make us what we are. Talking not just physically but spiritually. Nature and nurture. Nature is genetics. Uh, uh, nurture is the environment that makes our free choice. Which I asked a question this morning. And I know I asked Mohan the last time. And I say, what's your favorite food? It's your mother's homemade biryani lamb. Right? Biryani lamb. And I haven't tried the biryani round down the road here. I think Jair Sultan is a famous one. But to me, at the moment, until I try that one, and which I might change, the best one is still at the Ayer Raja, uh, some place there, and they cook there within two, three hours, finish. Uh, still the top biryani that is there. But I haven't tasted your mother's cooking. Uh, and so we never could come back. That is that. Uh, and let's say, our oh, brother here, what's your favorite food? Fish head curry. Okay. I haven't got a classification for that yet. So I haven't tasted enough fish head curry for a grading yet. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, Mimi knows a lot of good restaurants. <laughs> she has been introducing me. She's the one who introduced me to Penang Place here. Right. So that's where I introduced you all. So there's an original there. <laughs> and so fish head curry, hmm, not bad. Uh, but there's so many types, so many versions of fish head curry. I, I've tasted quite a few in Singapore. None have, none make my list yet. Okay, but there's one long, long ago when I was when I was uh, in Joe Baru, and my father used to buy fish curry, and they come in the margarine tin. Remember the big margarine tin? I don't know why they use margarine <laughs> in Johor Baru, and that was the best fish head we ever had. And you know Johor curry is more the lemak type. And uh, they can different levels of so curry can be measured in different di different areas uh, by how lemak it is. By the way, those of you online, what is lemak? Uh, how much level of coconut there is inside? So from no coconut to spicy to coconut level, and so measured by how lemak, measured by how hot in chili, measured by how many spices and flavor that is involved, and then measured by the type of taste and ingredients that are added. And you know, with curry. Uh, potato always makes the curry comes up and all that. So it depends. And then, and different food change the whole curry. You throw pineapple in, your curry will never be the same. Right? But it's unique. Unique. And you notice something about curry too. You know, I love to experiment too. Brinjal adds a different taste altogether. It makes it a bit slightly of a tasty kind of way. Mix with the rice, it goes, oh. Um. Okay, we better not go too far. Your saliva is dripping. Please wipe the saliva off your faces right now. We have uh, that nature and nurture, the dynamics. So you all know the answer, correct answer is both. When you say, how are we influenced by? You say both nature and nurture. But this morning, we got further. We say that's not good enough. We need to know the percentage. What percentage of our life is nature and what percentage is nurture? And so uh, I gave the A, B, C, D, E, uh, A, B, C, D, e, A, B, C, D, and then if, if, uh, whether it's 50 50 or 70 percent nature, 30 percent uh, nurture, which is free will, or is it 30 percent nature and 70 percent free will, or it's just slightly like 51 49. And uh, so we, all of you, all of you got different answers. And in the end, the conclusion was that it is, it is uh, a growth in the different percentage, but nature will always be the dominant. Because genetics is more powerful than free choice. The fact that you like fish egg curry. If you were brought up in, um, in England, where they might not have fish egg curry. Although today there's a lot of Indian dishes there. Let's say you were brought up in England in the 18th century. And then you might say, what's your favorite food? Fish and chips. <laughs> See, the, the, the environment has, uh, has changed your free choice and developed your direction in a certain dimension. And I mentioned that from the Bible, it's genetics and uh, free will or uh, is nature and free uh, and nurture equal? No. 
The Bible gives more precedence to genetics and nature. Both spiritual genetics rather than free will. But here we are on earth, we thought free will is such a big, big thing. And it does, it is big. It does affect our life. But we need to get our percentage and our perspective correct. You know, life is about perspective. If you got certain perspective wrongly, your whole life turns upside down. And like, you know, depend on people's viewpoint. If you were a legalistic person, everything looks different to you. Or if you're too liberal a person, life also looks different. So what is the balance? What is our comfort level? We need to find that. And what is the Bible's comfort level? That no matter what percentage, and we grow from certain percentage into uh, a larger percentage of average, that do you notice that, and let me, uh, let me finish this and I'll draw, draw the thing to continue from where we left off. So I said that if it's about uh, 30%, Okay, if it's about 30%, uh, this is nature, this is free will. So, it, the independence of free will is there. Or it cannot be here, because free will is independent of that, or this, or this little dimension. And uh, then we have a little equation for you, because all good theology can have an uh, uh, equation on that, and that is a little uh, calculus equation, the dynamics between dy, dx. And so we said that um, this is um, this one we call integral integral calculus. That let's say there is a boundary between A and B, and uh, calculus measures the, the 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 area under the curve. Say what area under the curve? You know you can measure a velocity even on the map physically. Let's say if you travel at you know certain uh, velocity at certain velocity in two different direction, uh, and two forces are working, then the the line between them is what will happen, the average force uh, that is there. Uh, like, for example, if the, a wind is blowing against you from your right side, and the wind is blowing at, let's say, 10 kilometers per hour, I don't know how strong that is, <laughs> then, and you're traveling in a straight line uh, at uh, 20 kilometers per hour. So it's obvious that you're not going to travel in a straight line. Because the acceleration uh, is traveling in this direction, but the wind is blowing you in this direction. Guess what direction you'll be traveling? This direction, right? So this direction would be the, uh, since this is a perpendicular and perpendicular, it would be the hypotenuse of the two points. So you draw 10, 20, and draw a line in between, now, that will be the line that you travel. And you can calculate the speed. Even though it's the wind blowing at you from your right side, exactly from your right side at 90 degrees, uh, 10 kilometers per hour, you're traveling at uh, 20 kilometers per hour. So, uh, say, since you say that A squared plus B squared equals to C squared, you remember the law of um, uh, Pythagoras' theorem. So, you will be uh, 10 plus 10, 10 times 10, 100, right? So let's get rid of the 0, 0, okay? So one, one, uh, 1 times 1, 2 times 2 times 2, that will be, uh, that will be 4 plus 1 and uh, uh, square root. So you'll be traveling at the square root of um, uh, 50 kilometers per hour. Not 50, square root. So square root, roughly what will make about 50, right? Anybody got a calculator that square root of 50? Eh? Seven, 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 seven times seven is 49. So you will roughly end up traveling about seven, uh, uh, you, you were roughly traveling about um, seven kilometers per hour in this direction. Funny, isn't it? That the total. So you can measure things on a map, on an area. So that's an area under the curve, measure certain speed of traveling. We say that uh, when you have an integral calculus, 
that there is always a limit. They call this limit, although they don't always write it down. And the limit is where you start the calculation. And so the limit is, let's say, free will to predestination. You cannot be over the limit here because if it's 100% predestination and zero free will, we all robot. We all robot. And no need judgment because we are not doing things based on free choice. How can we be judged for something that we never choose? And have you read in the Bible where there's a judgment seat for trees? Trees cannot be judged. Trees never exercise their free will. Right. Hey, by the way, what about judgment seat for animals? Okay, let me ask you, do animals have free will? Yes. How come no judgment seat? <laughs> no spirit. Okay. <laughs> right. Wait, wait, no judgment seat for the dog and say, why didn't you? Because animal free will is too easily manipulated. Why do you think elephants and dogs, you know, nowadays the dog shows and all that in, in uh, no, uh, Britain's Got Talent or what Got Talent. Remember one of Britain's Got Talent? I forgot which year the dog won. The dog can do tricks. <laughs> and all those things. Now, they are not born like that. They are not supposed to be that. And all animals are trained by using food. Food and reward system. You can make them do a lot of things. So their free will is too easily manipulated and not qualified for judgment seat. But the free will of the human, which has a spiritual force, is it, once you have spirit, means you, have, you can have what I call a self-contained life. All life comes from spirit. Therefore, it needs to be judged. Animal only got soul and body, but no spirit. Which is why Satan keeps existing for, for so long. He's a fallen spirit. Angels are called ministering spirits in Hebrews chapter 1. So there is a judgment seat. And because it produces and continues to produce a certain pattern, whether it's wrong or right. So we have what we call in this area here, uh, the balance. Too much of predestination becomes fatalism. Our free choice Make something, we are robots. If all free will, without predestination, everything runs wild. That means God left it to chance for everything to do that, and He loses control. That cannot be. God is always in control, and so we have that uh, balance between the two. That's basically what we talk about in the first service. But now we take it one notch further by asking. Uh, more questions on this area. Uh, and here we have, let me get my little pen. And we ask more questions in terms of the balance between predestination and free will. There are two, uh, trying to bring forth two points to cover at least for today. Uh, and um, let me see my color that is there. Okay, black is fine. And um, when we talk about the percentage where we grow, remember we talk about nature and nurture? And then I give enough scriptures this morning. Like Paul, he became an apostle. He was predestined to be an apostle, obviously. And um, he, his free will, he did not choose to be an apostle at first. He was the opposite direction. He was killing Christians, persecuting the church until Acts 9. He got born again, and then later on he wrote and mentioned in the book of Galatians chapter 1 that he was separated by God to be an apostle even from his mother's womb. Now, a baby in the womb, a fetus in the womb, does not exercise free choice yet. It's a subject of that. And then a uh, subject of the environment. Uh, Paul says that is definitely genetic. His genetics, his genetics was to be an apostle. But genetics alone cannot make him an apostle. He still must choose. Correct. He still must choose. The dynamics of choice is there. So let's write this area. Knowing that 
our starting point that is aimed for nature, nurture, and um, then on this extreme point, uh, oh, both are aimed, uh, nature, nurture, and to make it more spiritual, here is predestination, here is free will. And let's say these are the two extremes. And uh, on this side, no. If you're fully here, it's 100% nature. You're fully here, it's 100% nurture or free will. We know it cannot be the extreme. But then you notice something. That when you are growing, you started, this is Y, X. When you are growing, you started at this point because you didn't, you couldn't choose. And I'm not talking about just physical genetics. The fact that Paul could be an apostle and predestined to be an apostle before he was born is spiritual genetics. It's a spiritual dimension, spirit nature. So don't see N as a nature, as just physical nature, although we are affected by physical nature. Because it's obvious that every one of us look a bit like your father and mother if they are true biological parents. You take it from that, right? Once in a while, you have by Mendel's law a very strange occurring, right? Which is possible by Mendel's law that if a, a, a black person marry a white person, then uh, they might produce, you know, uh, uh, two brown person and then one white and one black. But all the genes inside are mixed. And then down the line, maybe a lot of brown, 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 and here some black, and some, then some white. Then down, 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 suddenly there is still the white gene somewhere. And then it might be black, 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 black. Boom, suddenly one child white, one child black. You know that it's actually there on the internet. Real biological parent. Mendel's law is at work. That means it's still hidden inside. Because remember, we have 46 chromosomes. Only 23 are necessary. The other 23 is a backup. Which means you've got two sets of chromosomes. God has a backup system. Not bad, huh? The, our chromosomes is a backup, it is a program. So we've got 23 plus 23. And there is a backup system. And the stronger one will always take preeminent. So you can have a weaker genetics. Like for example, uh, between uh, blue eyes and brown eyes. Brown eyes is a stronger genetic. So the tendency is more towards the brown. And a blue eye person marry a, a brown eye person, uh, a dark brown eye person. And uh, actually, do you know that nobody actually got black, black eyes? Yeah. Even those of us which normally look like black eyes, you look carefully, it's very, very dark brown or different degrees of brown. And uh, so, uh, there's no, even black, black eyes, who knows, that could be. You know, occasionally so 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 dark brown that it looks black in our estimation. Those are more rare. But most of us have dark brown eyes. And so, so if a dark brown marry a blue eye, then and then the children might, you know, depending how many children they have, uh, they might have, uh, let's say, you know, four kids or something. Maybe one of the kids have both gene, a dark brown. And actually, it's not just one gene. Remember. They have found that the color of the eyes caused by three, four genes, not just one gene, and uh, that, that somehow mix and, and the result comes forth. And then there might one with both genes produce brown. So forever they will never have blue on their side. But one other child with brown eyes might actually have a gene that is blue. And they, so maybe you know the, uh, the others are different. Now the one that has a weak gene that is blue might not see appear until maybe four generations down the road. It might suddenly appear. Where the person marry another person who has uh, a, a brown and a black, uh, a, brown, a brown and a blue gene. Uh, that means they have the weak genes there. And then somehow, one of the child has two of the blue genes. So no choice, come out, is blue. So all this is in our genetics that is there, but there's spiritual genetics that cause what we become, what we look like, spiritual genetics that are there between uh, X and Y. So remember, I'm not talking about just 
a natural, it applies to spiritual and natural. Anyway, you got enough scripture. Hebrew chapter 11, verse, six, uh, verse 3 tells you, the things in the physical are made of things from the spiritual. So everything in the, in the, in the physical is a pattern and a type for things in the spiritual. It starts in the spiritual first. And these natural things are hard to understand the dimensional spiritual. Having understood that, you notice that uh, taking this line to be here, that we grow from 100% na nature and we slowly grow with more and more free choice. More and more free choice. Wouldn't a 10-year-old have, have less free choice than a 21-year-old? And then an independent working person at 30 or 40 will move out to stay on their own. Got more free choice. See, our free choice increases. And it is possible that we grow to the point where we have, you know, uh, our free choice, we, we grow to the extent of uh, close to this level of 100%. But here's the thing. As you grow in God, you surrender your free choice. You also actually surrender your free choice. So, let's say you grow into this level. 100%, you got free choice. Then, the thing is, is there another growth where you grow and then you surrender your free choice back to God? It is still there, but you give it voluntarily. So it ends up as a circle. You start from here, you come back here. That is something interesting to consider. At what level and how we grow in free choice. That is a puzzling thing. Not everybody grows into that. Because, let's use a different color. Oops, wrong, wrong button. And, um, Okay, it was blue when I chose black. Okay. okay, let me see whether that's possible. Black now. That it is possible that we start from this point. Ah, now it's black. And we end up in this point. And then we stop. All we want is free choice. So the question is, is that progression? So remember from... This point, let's, let's call it here. A to B, B1 to A1. So, one is progression from 0 to 100. Free choice. Then to 100, back to 0. That's an interesting consideration. Which is where this morning question we say, what is the ideal percentage while you're walking on this earth? And we gave something like, you know, 70, 30. Because 70, 30, why do I choose that figure? Why not 60, 40? 70, 30 is like in the middle of 51, 49, and uh, 99, and 1. And 70, 40, uh, 70, 30 is nice because it has the number 7 and the number 3 that influences. Remember, we are built with certain numbers inside us and certain uh, resonance that is there. And the number 7 and the number 3 is embedded into the human psyche that is there. We have uh, 7 days a week. And uh, 7 is the number of perfection of revelation. The number 3 and 3... Three plus three uh, uh, is inside us. Uh, we have spirit, soul, and body. So there are certain things that are inbuilt in a numbering system resonance within us, which is why choose seven. And I will say, at the optimum point, I do not think that we will ever reach back to this point where we where we lose our free choice. Even in heaven, you can choose what clothes to wear. 
say, whoa, yes. <coughs> you can choose between robes for occasion. Yeah, the, the heavenly robes are quite nice. <coughs> and you can choose between no shoes. You know, in heaven, you don't need shoes, actually. You can go back feet. Or sandals. Or heavenly boots. Because I'm influenced from this earth still getting used to heaven, in heaven I got heavenly boots. So you can choose. I know one particular saint, his name is Sadhu Sunda Singh. In heaven, on this earth he got the, the yellowish clothing, his favorite. He actually only got like two pairs of clothes, one for washing and one for using. And he goes barefoot. He's known as a barefoot apostle. One of the most holy men that walk on the earth. Sadhu Sunda Singh, in heaven, also still like yellow color. Now, could he be forced to say, this is heaven? This is the color of heaven. White. <laughs> Pure white. No, he still can choose. And he still loves the yellow. If you ever meet him in heaven, you can tell that an all pure white, glittering, diamond color. Hey, there's a yellow guy. Free choice. So even in heaven, you got some level of free choice. And here's the interesting thing. We're influenced by this earth to a certain extent. We take something to earth. When you go to heaven and if you see Joseph, many times he still got the Egyptian style because he has lived a lot of his life in Egypt. But Egyptian fashion for us is 2,000 or 3,000, 4,000 years ago. But still, in sync. It's still because that is what they have liked and they enjoy. So heaven is God helps you to enjoy what you enjoy. And so his fashion is still the same. Remember something about Moses? When um, uh, Zipporah came and told the father that there's a man, she didn't call him a Hebrew. An Egyptian. But we know he's not Egyptian. But he is an Egyptian because he's been brought up in Egypt, got the fashions of Egypt, the taste of Egypt. And Zipporah says, an Egyptian. Because from all outward things, he's Egyptian fashion, Egyptian taste. All right, our modern world has become like a single culture to a certain extent. We got, we got you know, multicultural. Because all over the world, you know, some official functions, besides their, their traditional clothing, most people end up with suit and tie, the three-piece suit and tie. Right? In their parliaments, in everywhere, official clothing that is there. And they say, hey, it's quite universal. That is there. And with today's clothing all over the world, brands all over, it's, like, it's almost universal. Jeans and pants are quite universal. Unless you go to certain countries like uh, maybe Thailand and maybe uh, Myanmar, where it's traditional to wear the sarong. So you can find in a bank, the bankers all wear sarong. But it's an official sarong. The sarong might have a little belt also. But that's a fashion. To us, it might feel funny, but their culture, that's that. But yet, when they wear official things, they will still go three pieces. In war, in different things. So cultures are like, Mixing, matching, and everything. Heaven, you have a certain free choice. There is never a point when your free choice is totally removed. It's a question of percentage. How much you yield. So, without making it 100%, let's say 99%. So, here is 99% on this side. Uh, free choice. But between them, could be like, here is um, um, like different levels that are there. And let's take down here free view and that is predestination. So uh, then you, let's say they have 70% uh, of um, predestination, 30% of free will, or on opposite side, and 70% uh, of free will, or 30% of predestination. Uh, it is never 50 50. Because Anything where the free will gains equal and more becomes rebellion. 
You can never go beyond what is in your nature. Your nature will always influence you. If you're designed to be a coffee cup and you try to be a tea cup or a pot to keep plant, something in you is against. You're going against your very inbred nature of your physical genetics. And I'm sure when I go to any one of your houses, you will not serve me your coffee or tea using, I uh, know, uh, here imagine, this is like a plastic uh, pot, eh? let's imagine. Now I don't think I can pull the whole thing away. Uh, you wouldn't, let's pretend it's a pot. And I wouldn't go to your house and then, you know, you serve me a little pot and I say, wow, what kind of cup is this? Oh, this one you bought from the gardening store. <laughs> and it's clay and we're using it to drink coffee. Something is out of place. And then I go to your garden and I see a teapot-shaped pot. Out of it grows a plant. You say, we're using the teapot for plant. Yeah. <laughs> Something is wrong. Because the only thing is the teapot cannot speak. Not can the flower pot. But we all have a free will and there is a resonance. Something doesn't resonate right. And in fact, if it's a real good flower pot, at the end, at bottom, there might be holes on it. Because you cannot have the soil too soggy. So, and they say, hey, why, uh, why is your, your, your coffee pot got holes underneath? And they say, oh, that, uh, uh, I know that's for you for cooling. Then how do we use it? You use it at an angle. <laughs> so you pour it at this part, you hold the angle, so the holes that help you to cool. You know, you, oh, people are very clever to explain things away. And you drink your, co your coffee so from the side. And, uh, so, but it's not designed to be that way. Something will go wrong in that. So understanding that we actually grow in percentage. Do you notice when you're a baby, you're here? Baby. You're 100% almost or 99% dependent on nature. You cry and that. Then as you grow, by 21, you have more free choice. But if you're still subject to your parents or live with them or dependent on them, of course, they have some say. Then you move out on your own, 30. And then obviously, your free choice is different. Let's say you fall in love, you get married, suddenly, two free choice interacting, right? So, two persons interacting. Then, throw in your uh, in-laws. Oh, more interaction. So, you can see, then you get children. Oh, free choice. So, all the free choice has to, you have to have harmony. So, in a nation, that's why politics is a difficult thing. Because politics is uh, what I call, I call politics you know, the art of the compromise. Because everyone wants to choose a different thing. And you got to somehow reach an average and then persuade those who don't get everything they want, say, look, you got to compromise. Persuade those who want everything their way, you got to compromise. And you got to, on average, so that you could, everybody get something. But there will still be a group that you can never please. Uh, everybody understand. And then there's a group that never want to compromise. So those are the fringe groups. But most people will compromise for harmony. Which is why when you're at a traffic light, you cannot say you want all your traffic lights green all the time. You must have some red because you give room to the other side. If only one way always green, then the other is always red. Then you might say close the road up. We take turns. It's a out of compromise. As different free will is exercised. So we realize that there's an optimum flow on this earth in the exercise of that. I would average most optimum is around 70, 30 on the optimum. But as you become more comfortable with God in exercising less and less free will, although your free will is always 100% intact, you might go comfortable with 90 and 10. But you let God input things in your life and you still got certain 
choice. Like Paul, when he says in the book of Acts 21, I go bound in the Spirit. See, I thought he had three choices. But he has surrendered his free choice to God. And he, he is married to God's perfect will. He let God's perfect will affect his choice, even though he might not choose those things normally. Who in their right mind would choose 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul says he is three times beaten with a rod, five times beaten with 39 stripes, in shipwreck before, in hunger, in thirst, who in the right mind would choose that kind of a life? But Paul surrendered a lot of his free will to choose a life that God wants him to do. The perfect way of God. So it's obvious that surrendering to that is surrendering to the genetics, the predestination, right? Predestination is future genetics that God wants to do. Now, having established that as a chart, done, I need something more. And this part is where gets interesting. Let me draw the line first. And then, let's say, uh, okay, let me use a different color for this point. And this point is uh, pre-existence. Pre-existence. And this point Onwards is uh, new heaven, new earth, which leaves your point A to be here, your earthly life. Here is your present existence, present existence, which includes your past, present, and your future, which is between point A and point B. That is that. We know that, and let remind bring the old colors back, that before you came, God has already designed this entire life for you. Plan A. And you're supposed to uh, act on plan A in this life so that you will end up here as plan A in your life. But by free choice, by free choice, most of us oops, have, and here is where the free choice begins, we have chosen different routes. And, um, so our plan, we end up in plan B because we are born in sin nature. Because of Adam and Eve, we are all affected. We all move into plan B after sin came into the world. And the question is asked, has anyone ever fully just said plan A? Only one. Our Lord Jesus Christ <laughs> came to earth, leave plan A. That's it. Every one of us, we have meandered in different areas of plan B. And God has implemented His plan C. Uh, into our life. That is that. So He interacts with our free choice that is that. But, here is where we want to take off to today. Let's look at some scriptures and we realize from these scriptures that, which is what's the purpose of this teaching? To teach us nature must always be greater than nurture. Now, nurture could be your environment. Your environment might be hostile. You're still supposed to choose the right choice. You might be the only one out, one sheep out of 99. You're the one white sheep. Normally, the one black sheep. 
against 99 black sheep want to go the wrong way. You are still supposed to be accountable to choose the right way. So our environment, we agree, is no excuse. Whether you're born in Japan, you're born in the Middle East, you're born in Australia, you're born in Singapore, born in Malaysia, you're born in China, you're born in India, you're born in America, you have to come to know Jesus Christ. You have to come to know God. You have to meet God. Our environment is no excuse. Whether you come from a broken home or a very loving family, whether you're lost both parents or one of the parents. No excuse. You still must come to know God. Can you see that you cannot excuse by nurture? Yeah, oh, you know, because of this environment, please, you know, I still need to go to heaven. Uh, no, look how difficult it is for me. No excuse. In our world, present world, we see stories. You see stories of people who are born paupers becoming billionaires. And you see stories of billionaires becoming paupers. Which prove one thing. Success or failure has nothing to do with whether you start easy or start hard. It just has to do with if you decide on certain things. Now, your decision alone cannot make the success. You need God's blessing. God's blessing to make you successful and to control the part that you cannot control. Because we know what is true in life. That in life, you might be the most talented, the most gifted, the most skillful, but you don't have the opportunity, you still don't make it. God still needs to open the door and create the opportunities for you. We still need help in different areas. So it's not always the most clever, the most successful. Uh, it's not necessarily the most clever, the most uh, uh, wise, or the most um, uh, intelligent. Maybe someone more intelligent didn't make it. So you never hear of the person. So it's obvious that skills, intelligence, talents, and all this will equip you, but you still need the favor of God, the blessing of God to give you the opportunity to serve. That comes from God. Uh, that's in God's control, the part that He has. And so knowing all these dynamics, uh, at the end of the day, which is the message of bringing forth from predestination, what we call predestination and pre-existence, to remember that our genetics, spiritual genetics, is very important. And free choice, I like to put it this way, the ideal formula, only 30%. Free choice, only 30%. We still enjoy free choice, but it's only a limited percentage, just for the enjoyment of of God. And let's uh, show forth in, uh, and then in terms of nature, is, that is why in um, predestination, in uh, Romans chapter 8, very quickly, I just read some verses in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are conformed to the image of Jesus. Notice it is to be, not to do. Being comes before doing. I repeat again, being is the greater percentage than the doing. When you find the being part, the doing becomes easy. Now, you have verses like John chapter 15. These are verses that are familiar to you, but it's best good to read them. When Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 1 to 5, and then he says in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Do you notice the word of itself? Means your free will cannot make you what you are. Your free will is an expression of who you are.
although on this earth, when we look at something, and I will deal with that, how much of our free will can affect that? We talk about that. But let me settle this, okay? Let's settle the foundation. That from the Bible, nature rules over nature. And predestination and pre-existence rules over free will. It is who you are, who you design to be, that God opens the doors accordingly. That causes your DNA to function in a certain way. That subconsciously influence you, whether you like uh, uh, mom's uh, biryani, mutton, fish, curry fish head. And by the way, where do you eat your curry fish head? Your mother. Your know, mother made it? Or you like it somewhere? Little India. But you love curry fish head. When do you love it? Because from the time you're small, Your mother made it. See all this influence of mama. <laughs> mama really changed the diet of the kids. Powerful influence. Uh, uh, another example of mama. Okay. Right. Uh, no, or environment. See, it cannot bear fruit of itself. That means the branch want to choose and choose to do it cannot. It's limited by its attachment to the wine. And it says here, I'm the wine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, position yourself in me, be in me. And then you can produce a fruit. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And um, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. I mean, not of your, just free choice. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Then verse 10. See, works is free will. So it's saying your free will cannot save you. You must change your nature. says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works. And you know what good works are? You don't actually do them. Which God prepared before that, we should walk in them. Not do them, but walk in them. They come naturally like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It grows out from you. That's the first fundamental principle that we must get into our spirits and our head. You cannot do unless you be. The being part. Now, I like to illustrate from Jesus training with his disciples. Because when I was teaching on visualization and in visualization and confession, I use Abraham's example as a ratio. That means ratio is how much you should do this opposed to the other thing. And since Abraham started visualizing in Genesis uh, chapter 15, when God showed him the stars, and way back uh, when God took him out and says the dust, uh, in chapter 12, the, everywhere you see, where you see, you know, walk through a line of breath of this place and the dust where you are, uh, your children will be like the dust. So it's very visual. He was around, let's say, 75 years old to 80 years old. Let's say the number of years when he came out. And God made a covenant with him. He, he changed his name from Abraham to Abraham at the age of 99. At the age of 100, he got a child. So rounding off, counting easier, we realized it's about, if he started visualization, visualization when he came out of the land of Mesopotamia or Ur, it would be 20, uh, 75. Here he's 100 years old. Is a ratio of nearly 25 is to 1. Which means, what you see is 25 times more powerful and more important than what you say. But in faith teaching, they teach the opposite. Before, they never teach a person to visualize. 
he said the teacher person to confess. Based on Mark chapter 11, verse 20, 24, correct? Which the word speaking and believing what you say occurs at least three times. The emphasis on the spoken word. But then it says, shall not doubt in the heart. That means the three powerful places where it says, believe what you say, have what you say, the emphasis on spoken word, was dependent on one thing, what's going on in the heart. One tiny doubt, all your, your infrastructure of the spoken word falls apart like, uh, like uh, dust being blown by the wind. So visualization to confession, visualization is 25 times more important. But you still need to confess. Spoken word. But how many people are taught to visualize before they confess? They are not, which is why the failure of the faith message. Because most faith messages only preach what you say is what you get. They never preach what you see is what you can say and then what you get. That would be the faith message, balance. Balance. What you see will produce what you say. And actually, if you see long enough, you will say it. You won't even struggle to say it. Because you actually see it. And you talk about it. See, a lot of people try to confess healing. But every time they close their eyes, they can see the funeral going on. How are they going to die? So how? The two is not working. So there is a ratio between visualization and confession. There is a ratio between being and doing. And I will take the ratio as three is to one. Based on the fact that Jesus took them for three years, and then send it out in one year. But wait, 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 wait. That's not enough. If we take Jesus' life, it's 30 years is to 3 years, which means the ratio is 10 is to 1. In 3 years, Jesus did everything that he had prepared himself for 30 years. Yes, Jesus also had to prepare himself. So 30 years, 3 years. You even it out, 10 is to 1. So I like to take the life of Jesus as a good example because Paul, before he began his ministry, was about 10 years behind the scene. Paul was born again about Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 is around A.D. Um, AD 35. Acts chapter 13. When he left for the ministry, the Holy Spirit said, separate me Paul and Barnabas for the work which I have for them. It was about AD 45. Plus and minus. 10 years. 10 years for Paul to discover who he is before he start doing the work. And when we take this, those ratios, I would say being is 10 times more important than doing. It doesn't mean that it will take us 10 years before you can do something. But remember, even in the natural world, Somebody discover the principle of 10,000 times. You never heard that? When you do something for 10,000 times, you reach your best at doing it. Uh, that, that's something from the, from the secular world. Uh, like, let's say, you know, when you have hit the tennis ball for 10,000 times, by the 10,000 times, oh, you're really good at it. Somebody, uh, it's, just, it's not, they, go, no, no, they just average out kind of thing. But nothing to do with our Bible. In our Bible, I'm trying to look for ratios. And it seems to indicate that being is 10 times, 10 times the work 
than doing. And if we don't give clue to that, and you might reduce it, let's say 10 months is to one month. So let's say one month you've got to do something, you might spend 10 months preparing for it. Ten of the ratio, 10 to 1. When we bring this ratio into the spiritual graphs that we're doing, uh, that's the first point that I mentioned. How much of being versus how much of doing? Being is 10 times is to doing one time. So for every action, one action, you might have actually built inside you the energy for the action. 10 times to create that kind of proper action that comes forth. And most people, they just simply act. So it never comes forth. You got to build into you before it can come out from you. 10 is to 1. It's taking Jesus as our ratio uh, from his years on earth. That's the first thing that is determined. Then the second thing that we want to determine, uh, and um, let me just go to the chart now. Here's the chart. So we know, let me see what are the colors I have. Uh, okay, this green color is fine. And uh, taking the chart that is there, we know that when we were born, this DNA is there from the spiritual side. This one can be um, millions of years. Remember, pre-existent from long ago. It's been built in our spiritual DNA and it has to merge with our physical DNA when we came to the earth. Remember the books? The books are our DNA and all those things we're supposed to be. So we start at this point. God has built the genetics into us to live this short life on earth that we are to do. We have to settle the second question. We really settle the fact that being is more important than doing our nature. I think I'll give A, B, C, D again. Okay. A. All our genetics is there, spiritual and natural, when you were born. B, some of your genetics was there when you were born and some of your genetics result from your free choice. Okay, some and some. I didn't give percentage yet. C, all your genetics are in the spirit and your free choice will release them on earth. <laughs> okay. That means they're spiritual but not real. Your free choice will make them real into your life. D, Your free choice doesn't add to your genetics. It can only open or close. Okay, all ready for A, B, C, D. Right? Yes? Of course, yeah. Yes. It also has a physical dimension. Okay, how many choose A? No, no. Okay, let me summarize. Huh? You're all probably confused a bit. A is everything before you're born. B is some before you're born, some after you're born. Release. C. That is, uh, C would be that, remember I used to open and close. That everything before you're born, but your choices just open or close them. D, everything before you're born is spiritual. What's important is here. 
and what you choose here affect everything. Now, don't forget this chart here. Before you choose, before you choose, remember here New Heaven, New Earth? New Heaven, New Earth. So before I make you choose A, B, C, D, your position here in New Heaven, New Earth Is it because of one, you're predestined, or some things that happen between here, two, three, four, before you go? The answer, I better give the answer for this question. It's obvious that God might have predestined everyone to be part of new heaven, new earth. Has to be what? Because God is God. Not everyone make it. And some end up in the dark area. They are called the sons of perdition. They are doomed here. Remember Judas is carried. God knows all his choices and he's already doomed here. Before he, be, when God selected the disciples in Luke chapter 6, he says, and Judas who will betray him. Huh. Before he betrayed, really say he'll betray. Before he chose to betray, really, God revealed. So some of the prophecies are foreknowledge. But God knew the ending. And Jesus called him the son of perdition. So we do know that everyone who is here is here by free choice or here by free choice. Cannot blame God. Everyone is there by free choice. Knowing that, is it A, B, C, or D? How many say A? Hey, I thought you were A. Change it. Okay. How many says D? Some, some. Okay. And then, all there but open here. C. Some, some. And D, all caused by here. Okay, none D, some D. Interesting question, correct? To understand this, remember that plan A is an area of uh, free choice, our choices. Remember how I talked about, let's say this being, let's say level one. Then, oh, I'm going to choose the wrong color. And um, let's choose the green to illustrate the free choice. One. Then, as you choose, if you choose towards God, you end up level 2. Now, there can be more levels than level 2, right? Level 2 is the differentiation. When you choose level 2, God already says, you belong here. That means He knows you choose God. Of all your choices that you choose, you are level 2. He knows you will choose Him. Or, oh, let's take the dark color. That you choose level 2 minus 2. Level minus two. Minus two. So by this stage, you belong here. And let me get back the green. By this stage, you belong here. Because in theology, Good theology, we have to believe that everyone start here. Ah. Start here, okay. Okay. God cannot plan for someone to be lost. Inconsistent. God has to have a plan for every man and every woman and every child. Paul says, it is God's will that all men be saved. So obviously, God planned for all to be saved. That has to be his original plan. 
But at some point, at some point as they choose, they enter level plus two or minus two. So God looks back at everything and says, these are all the minus two. I will now use them for judgment. Here are all the plus two. I will use them to show my attributes. So we know that we know that let me see a good color. Okay. We know that this whole section was what changed the being. Because Jesus said in Matthew, a tree is either bad or good. A bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. He's talking about nature, not nurture. We all know because of statement number one, God made all things good. You even have the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And he said, God says, He saw everything and it was good. It was good. It was good. When He created all the animals and humans, He say, it, by human time, humans came and said, It was very good. <coughs> Nothing was bad. The whole Genesis 1 emphasized everything that God made was good. No evil. Everything was good. But it became evil. <coughs> Until Genesis 6, God has to destroy the whole world, leaving only eight souls to start all over again. He almost wants to start over and over again. Even like when he was with Moses, he wanted to start all over again because they were rebellious. <coughs> they to get rid of all the bad. And some collateral damage in between. And start all over again. So it is obvious that even though here is the original, here was what makes the whole thing. Remember? First statement, no evil can be here. Even Judas is carried and all those evil people who end up in hell today and those who do evil. Adolf Hitler and all those things. They must have been planned to be good. All of their spirits when they came to the earth, before they pre-exist, they must be good. Because if they were bad, they would have been classified with the fallen angels. Every human spirit that came onto this earth by pre-existence has to be good. Wow. To get that across, we better make some statement. Right. And make sure it's a clear statement. One. All, emphasize, are good. Then, statement two. Some became bad. Fair statement? Some became bad. Now, when they became bad, their nature changed. To be fair, it cannot begin before this line. It has to begin after point A to B. Right? They cannot pre-exist as bad and then come here to fulfill their badness. They must pre-exist as good. All agree? Pure logic. Scriptural logic. So, some became bad. Has to be between point A and point B. Which brings us to this statement. Some genetics are being changed between point A and point B. 
which means not all the genetics before point A were firm. Because God can go back in time. Based on his foreknowledge, based on the choices that people make, here is the puzzle. Here's a puzzle. God, short form for God, Peter. God uh, reverse. Uh, reverse reverse nature in quantum time QT as a person chooses from point A to point B now let's say a person exists on the let me make the line stronger okay let me make the line stronger hey it didn't come out well Okay, God, as a person makes the choices level two, oh, level two, it comes to that state, God goes back, oh, didn't intend to do that, goes back and takes away from that. God doesn't, remember, God doesn't, uh, create evil. But everything that he has is a complete. Remember this one. This is complete. Everything for the human race is contained within the human race. This and this are equal. Everything here has to be everything here for his plan to work. Remember, God controls his whole plan. But who gets what is controlled? Like for example, let's take one small guy here. The guy with five talents plus five. The guy with two talents plus two. Correct. The guy with one talent minus one. And drop into here. Hey, he refused it. Drops into that. And the plus five plus one. Because Jesus said, let his talent be given to the other guy. And then some of the people say, Master, he already got ten. Now he adds one more. Eleven. So the original plan Let's take these three people. Mr. A, Mr. B, and Mr. C. Originally, his plan from here, A, B, and C all go into New Heaven, New Earth. If they finish on Earth. Before they came, one was specially designed to have five talent, five posts. One designed for two, one designed for one. And when they go through, the one failed. Now, because his work is important, it has to be creating all of New Jerusalem. All New Jerusalem is created by humans. Cannot have a missing brick. That one has to go somewhere. It goes to A. So while here it designs according to the original plan, A, B, and C go to New Heaven, New Earth. Reality, A and B go to new heaven, C go to hell. What causes it between point A and point B? Okay? Free choice. So you can see that our free choice is affecting us. Wow, free choice is important. This morning, free decision is so important. So you left it. Wow, free destination. Now, afternoon. Wow, 
Oh, free choice. Okay, let's get the two together. The point is still this, that remember what the first point that I made, that everything is based on nature. Free choice is only still a percentage. So how do we harmonize the truth? And it's a very important truth. What happens is, to change nature here. Although the changes are taken back in time and put there, and then it affects here. Let's say if I go back in time and see that maybe you have a weakness in your bone, and if I could manipulate time and travel in time anywhere, and I know what stem cells you need. So I go back in time and put the stem cell there. Suddenly you grow without that. That part. Because it's been put in your past. Only God can do that. So it looks like, hey, originally you're still there. But this point of free choice is important. It's changing our nature. Which is where we are. Changing our nature here. Is it scriptural doctrine? Yes. Weren't our nature changed when we were born again? It was a decision here, not a decision made before in pre existence. And here's the thing you could not make that decision then. You were not in a position to make the decision then. It is just like a, 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 little, ch a little child or teenager who is not qualified to drive a car. Can the teenager make a decision to drive or not to drive to Malaysia? Not even there to make the decision. First, no driving license. Second, no car. But the teenager grows up, got driving license. Teenager obtained a car. Got license, got car. And then got enough uh, knowledge how to drive that. So the teenager now got more free choice to make decisions that are important. Before that, no chance to make it. Okay. Coming to the earth was an important part of, instead of the line go this way, can you see that, that line go this way? See here? God designed and here is where I need to get nice color out. Let's see. Nice one. I think bright red will do. I remember there was a very nice bright red. Ah, there you are. Okay. God designed, okay, thinking this first shot, that this was designed to go through here and then finish up here. It was in the plan of God. Okay, let me take a strong pen pigment. Okay. Can you see that? And it is not, no. Nope. That means new heaven and new earth was designed to be here. Let's look at how scriptural it is. Did Jesus need to come to earth? He needed to. He needed to become a part of it. Jesus got many names. He's known as Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. Mighty God, Word of God, Jesus. The name Jesus, does it apply to Jesus? Okay. Oops. Does it apply to Jesus here, came at point A and B, or Jesus here? 
Jesus here between point A to B, correct? So let me draw a little cross. Jesus came, let's say at a point in history. There he is, the cross. And here is Jesus before he came. Say, what is that? That's the throne room, right? <laughs> Ancient of days. Ooh, ah. Okay. Here is Jesus, Lamb of God. Yum, 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 yum. Okay. Smiling. Okay. So, even the words Lamb of God tells us something on earth too. Jesus was a name given to the manifestation of God here, not the manifestation of God here. There was no way Jesus has missed salvation. And when this Jesus rose from the dead and went to heaven, God says in Philippians 2, let every name, name, and worship the name of Jesus. Why did he need to do that? Because his title was the word. Now he took something from the earth. Something new was added. A new layer. So this planet Earth adds a layer of DNA you cannot get. That can only be given on Earth in the midst of darkness and death. It's like a sword. A good sword made in the old style, must be bang over and over again, and then it dip it in hot fire, right? They put it in hot the, the iron or the mixture, the steel, hot iron. Oh, hot. Take it out, bang. And then they put it in the cold, super cold water. Shoom. And then they repeat again. And they repeat again. And in science, they have observed a molecular change. The molecules of the steel and iron rearrange, rearrange, and rearrange. And the more times they make it, the more it's rearranged until it's solid. How many times? Hot, cold. Hot, bang, cold. Hot, bang, cold. Hot, bang, cold. That's why the salt very expensive. Very important to be part of that. It changed the molec mole molecular structure. Isn't molecular structure talking about DNA? That one we talk about salt and metal. And here's the thing. Whatever you answer A, B, C, D, this should become clearer now. That even though we receive the original here, there was something you can only receive here and in this life. Which is why no other angel, spirit being, or other inhabitants of the universe could receive what we receive because you know why. The planet Earth was where the fire is. Where you experience extreme hot, extreme cold, and you change your DNA. The other places, Godly locks, not too hot, not too cold. Baby bear. But here on earth, you face extreme hatred and extreme love that God demonstrates. It changes your idea. So you, you receive, you receive. Your original DNA. Now we got words. Your original D. Remember your OS. Then you have your glorified DNA. And then you enter into the fullness of God's 
DNA. Only by going to the lion's feet can you earn. That is why the Bible says in Romans 8, Whom he foreknew, he predestined. He called, he glorified. Now you know why this earth is important? Why your free choice are still important? And why angels don't have that privilege? Because, I can tell you, all the angels, when they came to the earth in the book of Genesis time, to live on the earth, every one of them fell when they became flesh. When they took on human flesh, only one succeed, Malki said that, with the permission of God. And he did not really become flesh, he was in a form of Malki Sedek. They, he dealt, because our DNA is very hard to handle. Very hard to handle. Because of the force of gravitational pull that want to pull you down. But yet you can raise the highest. Think about that. Your ability to experience pain is the same ability to experience pleasure. If you are sensitive, which is an advantage, you might also be sensitive to other things that are painful. So the crucible for new heaven, new earth, the crucible for that is here. A special place. God has made the earth a special place. It is a production center for the fallen part of the universe. Appreciate your coming to the earth. Appreciate and now, why you know there is a danger in coming? And great reward in coming. So don't get discouraged if sometimes you're struggling with this earthly life. The rewards are great. If you persevere and remember the first point, nature is above uh, nurture. That is still important because you, your DNA here is being changed in order for you to make the right decisions again. Remember the ratio 10 is to 1 which implies that let's say our life is from A to B. Right, let me use a different color. Our life from A to B uh, starting from here, A to B. At different points in our life we learn one thing. Change your nature before you do something. Allow enough time to soak in the DNA of God, from God, and follow that law, which means 10 times abiding, one time action. He said, abide in me, let my words abide in you. So you do 10 times of that. Which is why when Paul talked about the perfect will of God in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, what kind of action was he asking for? Present. Present your body as a living sacrifice. He did not say go and do something. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Now the word prove means the action come. Before the action come, there's presenting and renewal. How long does that take? Ten times. As long as it is just to prove. Ratio of ten is to one. As long as you remember this law, that whatever God wants you to do, let God give you a spoken word. 
absorb, absorb 10 times before you can do. And let something be built inside you first. Some part of God's DNA comes into you and yet how long will you know when the Holy Spirit tells you? When did Paul know to start his apostolic ministry? When the Holy Spirit said, remember what we, they were doing in Acts 13? They were just worshipping God. Worshipping God. Which comes to the point we emphasize in this morning service. That at the end of the day, all predestination brings you back to God and on your knees before God. And you're spending time waiting on God. Remember all the scriptures on waiting. Put all the scriptures on waiting. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagle, with, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Even young people will faint. Does that tell you something? That if you receive a transformation in the DNA, you can do more than a young man. And scriptures like 1 Corinthians 2, that is taken from the book of Isaiah, that say, they that wait on the Lord, then trans translated by Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, that those who love him. I has not seen, not yet heard, not entered the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for, not those who do, but those who wait, those who love him, those who worship him. How is that going to happen? By putting yourself in the presence of God, allowing God, Abiding in Him, abiding in Him, and allowing God to change your DNA. Your spiritual DNA, and then your natural DNA, whatever is natural to When God changes your inside, and then when you walk out, the doing is a consequence or a flow. You never struggle to do what is already in your DNA. But the revelation that your DNA can change, that is what you go for. And why we need to wait on God. Remember the saw. You thought that you already pray. Well, oh, pray enough. Ah. All night prayer, prayer, not enough. Ah. But still God put you into the fire and then beats you and then throws you in the cold water, starts again. You say, Oh, enough, enough. Then, ah, you come in the fire again. When you bear much fruit, what did Jesus say? pruning, that you will bear more fruit. So you thought it's finished. And you say, God, you know, one time enough. One day, ah! And you push it in the fire until you almost melt, become liquid. But you cannot, it doesn't want you to become liquid, then you cannot burn you. So it's just enough, soft enough. Then he puts you there, he say, while you're fending your breath, here comes the hammer. Kikang, 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 kikang. Ah, not fair, Lord. Why me? No, not fair. Because God wants you to be the best sword. And while you're protesting, and you say, enough, la, Lord. I cannot take it anymore. Enough, la, Lord. And then finally, the banging stops, the heat stops, and God takes you, and then suddenly, you're into the cold water. Ah, like rubbing salt into your wound. And you thought, that's enough. Then God starts again. <laughs> How long? Ten times abiding. What do you think abide in God is sweet, sweet, soft, soft. All abiding in God is... Ah. Waiting on God is... <laughs> what do you think that's right there? Hey, all these things is to change your DNA. You know how long it takes to change your DNA? The process? Remember... Present your body as a living sacrifice, your mind be transformed. There is something going on your inside. It is molecular change. Molecular change puts you to the extreme. So suddenly, you know, there, there's this persecution and that persecution and that persecution and this and that and this. Say, ah, 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 ah. And then you say, die, die, die. God says, yeah, I'm trying to make you die. You're still alive. You're talking, so you're not dead yet. <laughs> 
You know a man like Elijah? He has to die. <laughs> so until you say, oh, until your words change from die, 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 because I yield, I yield. Not good enough. Right? You say, die, 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 not good enough. You, 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 not good enough. No. Until whatever God did, you say, thank you, praise the Lord. Then he put you into bank. Every bank, you say, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Wow, really did, huh? <laughs> then he puts you into the, the, the cold water. <laughs> All the steam coming out from you. And the only steam that came out from you, the fragrance and the incense is, Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And under all that comes out from you is, I thank you, I choose you, I love you, I worship you. No more complaint. No more anything. Your DNA has changed. And as it changed, something else began to change all around you. That's what God is doing in this life. And there are lots of changes, especially in this end time. In this end time, we will see molecular change in the spirit, in our soul, in our body. This is the glorious church. God allows it at our time. So let's rise to this level. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you open our heart and our mind to understand your word. We ask, oh God, that we may catch a vision of what our predestination is. But knowing our predestination and having the predestination built into our DNA is something else. And having it nurtured into us until we can work out what you work in, inside each one of us. So let it be so in our life. We yield to you, Father. We yield to your work. And we choose to worship you. We choose to praise you for all that you do. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name. Let's all rise together. We thank you, Father. We praise you. And we worship you. Lift up your hands before the Lord. Father, you see these hands lifted up. You see every one of those here, those online who are reaching out to you. We want to fulfill your destiny. And nothing less than that, Father. But what can satisfy us in this life? riches, fame, pleasure. Nothing is greater than doing your will, O oh Father. Your will is meet to us, Lord, as it was to Jesus. So, Father, we ask that you cause us to so desire that predestination, that destination and that, that, that work and the scrolls and the, the book that's written on our lives. Help us to desire it, Father, more than life it itself. So that every one of us who hear this word will give ourselves to your word, to your revelations, to all the destiny that you have. And we can only say one thing, Father, like Jesus taught us. Let your will be done in our lives according to your word. Let it be unto us according to your word. Let your word be true, Father God. So we choose you. We choose to yield. We choose to worship. We choose to fall under the hands of the mighty God. To let you mold us and make us to be all that you want us to be. Let your predestination begin powerfully in this life, Father. And change and transform our DNA. For we learn today, we can only do what you first build into us, the nature. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, and everyone say Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah.